Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Um, thank you for joining us. You must count as one of the few people in this country who work on a Friday afternoon. <laughs> um, we hope that this time will be well spent for you. And uh, this engagement is part of a conversation in our data for decision-making series, which is hosted jointly by <clears throat> the Teaching and Learning Office and the UKZN Access and Success Advisory Forum, also known as ASIF. So let me begin with a special welcome to Professor Diane Grayson. Welcome home, Diane. Diane is a UKZN alma mater. It's wonderful to have you back. So the name Diane Grayson should resonate with many of us, not least because of her sterling work on the Quality Enhancement Project, the QEP, which she managed from 2013 to 17 at the Council on Higher Education. And of course, you will know that the QEP was lauded as a revolutionary approach to institutional audits and evaluation using the appreciative inquiry framework. She championed this national project, project designed to improve student success systemically. So I have the privilege, privilege of working with Diane in various national structures and committees, including the um, coordinating committee for enhancing the framework for academics as university teachers, and the National University Teaching Excellence Awards, Teaching Awards. In all of these engagements, she demonstrates inspirational leadership. And through our mutual commitment to systems thinking, I've come to appreciate Diane as an, what I call an, or what she calls an ideas entrepreneur, as someone who is able to see opportunities and possibilities where many of us see obstacles and cul-de-sacs. Spend five minutes with Diane and she will surely inspire a new idea or project. In recognition of her intellectual labors, Diane has received various teaching awards in the country. And in 2021, she was recognized as a principal fellow of the United Kingdom Higher Education Academy for a leadership role in higher education. This is an exceptionally prestigious award. Since 2018, the Senior Director of Academic Affairs at WITS, responsible for teaching, student learning, student success, academic development, quality assurance, and access. Supporting Diane in this mammoth work, uh, is the student success team at FITS, headed by Kevin McLaughlin, who heads up the business intelligence division at FITS, um, which comprises data engineering, data science, institutional research, and statutory reporting. His focus is on developing the analytic capabilities and platforms that can make an impact on supporting student success and to inform policy and strategy at the institutional and national levels. Kevin holds a BSc in computer science and an MBA from WITS. Kevin is an unassuming powerhouse of knowledge with a passion for institutional research and data for decision-making. So the theme for today's seminar is Strength in Numbers appropriately titled, Working Together to Harness Useful Data for Student Success. So Diane and Kevin uh, will speak for around an hour, followed by Q&A and discussion. Please feel free to insert your Q&A, your comments um, in the chat or in the Q&A forum. Over to you, Diane. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ravi, and thank you for such a generous introduction. And yeah, it's been fabulous working together all these years and, and with many others at UKZN. Um, I just see someone posted in the chat who I remember from 1991, I think. 
Uh, okay, so let me share my screen and you know, this is gonna be um, a duet, uh, but we won't be speaking at the same time. <laughs> so I, I, will I will share the first uh, few slides um, and speak to them. And then I'm gonna hand over to Kevin to, to speak about the more data related um, stuff. So, so what I'm gonna do is just give you a, a kind of broad overview of our student success work, where we've come from um, and where we are now. And then, as I said, Kevin will give you the details of, of all the, the data, how it's collected, how it's used, um, how it's uh, quality assured and so on. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. So yeah, here's an overview. I think I'm gonna skip that slide actually. Um, so, so what's the big deal? Why is student success so important? Well, if you look at these figures from the uh, OECD, which is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, and you look at tertiary attainment of 25 to 34 year olds, you'll see that South Africa is down here, right at the bottom. We have the lowest level of tertiary educational attainment of all of the countries that were surveyed. Um, and yet we've had this radical transformation of the student body, but we still have low numbers of students who are completing in minimum time, which is expensive. Uh, it's expensive for the students, it's expensive for the universities, it's ex expensive for the whole system. Um, and, and so we've got to do something about it. Now, this is a graph that Kevin produced, which I think is, is very interesting. It shows how our enrollment by race has changed at WITS in the last 25 years. So you can see that the demographics have changed completely from 1994 when we were a historically white and predominantly white institution to 2020 uh, where we are uh, predominantly a, a university serving African students. So the increase in, in students in this time has been 119%, enormous, but in particular, the increase in African students has been um, sevenfold. So we, we have a student population that is much more diverse, but in addition, a lot of our students are first generation at university, and I guess we would share this in common with UKZN. Um, and also students for whom English is not their first language. Um, so, so these students are uh, in, a, in a position where they're facing a number of challenges. And if we want our students to succeed, which of course we do, then we need to be very intentional about how we go about doing that as an institution. So before 2019, uh, we did a survey of what support was offered to students. And we identified lots of islands of support all over the university, lots of people in the university who really cared about supporting students and were offering various forms of support. Some of these were little islands that were only designed for maybe students in a particular group, in a particular year, in a particular faculty or school, um, and then some that were offered at an institutional level, but they were disconnected. Uh, the people that offered these various forms of support had little or no contact with other people offering support. And so the poor student had to swim in the sea of support from one island to another, each time telling their story afresh and sometimes thinking. So in 2019, we assembled a task team, which I was asked to convene. And I, I want to point out the composition of this task team because it was rather unconventional. So WITS historically operated in quite a siloed way. Um, we, we had people working. So, so we have a very devolved management system and I think KZN does as well, where, where faculties operate almost as, as mini universities. Um, and then there are centrally run units, but they don't necessarily uh, connect all that closely with the, the faculty run uh, structures. So, so we created this task team 
that was um, not the very top senior executive members. It was this kind of next layer down. Uh, so the Dean of Students, the Assistant Deans for Teaching and Learning from our five faculties, the Head of Student Academic Development, Kevin is the Head of Business Intelligence Services, our Head of Institutional Research, um, which actually now falls under Kevin. Um, we had student leaders, and we had the director for our center learning teaching and development so this was the task team and what we did is we we set to work saying how might we go about offering support that's centered on the students rather than centered on us and what do i mean by centered on us well a lot of the support was centered on um what is the unit that's doing the offering of the support uh, so you could identify the support in, um, by identifying the unit rather than what was the need of the student. Uh, and, and so we drafted a framework. We actually brought in a couple of systems engineers from VITS and they, they ran a full day workshop for us on systems thinking. Um, and then they continued to help us with our consultations for most of the rest of the year to try and take a, a systems approach to how do we create a holistic uh, student success framework. Um, and then we, we wrote various drafts and we uh, circulated them all around the institution and we did focus groups with students and we uh, presented to every appropriate body we could think of, <laughs> academic and student uh, focused and um, the senior management group, which was which is an interesting group at Vits of all the the directors and heads of the various support units across the university, and in the end we came up with this model where the student is at the center, and then we identified four broad areas in which we felt students need support. So one is academic, of course, and and we defined this quite broadly. So Academic support could include actually career guidance um, and then obviously a range of academic skills and literacies, curriculum advice, support with individual subjects and also support with research skills. So, so one of the things that we are trying to be more aware of at BITS is that um, our postgraduate students also need support. Just because they're a little older doesn't mean that they, they don't need support. And in fact, um, we've been much more intentional in the last couple of years about offering more holistic support for postgrad students. Um, this year, actually, we, this year, last year, not sure, COVID kind of blurs timeframes. Um, we instituted a postgraduate student experience program which is being run by student affairs, but collaborating very closely with the postgraduate office. Um, and I guess for Vitz, I mean, I guess this is important for all universities, but for Vitz, it's particularly important because we are something like 38% of our students are postgrads. So, okay, that's a little bit of an aside. So the, the one area of support, as I mentioned, is academic. A second area of support is health and wellness. So, you know, medical support, uh, counseling, peer support, disability support, gender related and information and awareness. A third area is personal development, uh, work experience, life skills, transitions, like from school to first year, but also from final year out into employment or to postgrad studies, leadership and skills development and extracurricular activity oh, and employability. And then the fourth cluster of support is material needs, uh, safety, food, international student logistics, funding, of course, accommodation, and childcare. We're not very good at this one yet, but we recognize that it's, it's a need, and particularly for our growing postgraduate student population. Now, one of the things that's interesting about this model is that if you look at the various forms of support that are in the lower case around these four big blocks, those forms of support are offered by all kinds of people and units and structures across the organization. 
Um, so for example, if I just look at the health and wellness. So counseling is offered by our uh, careers and counseling development unit. Medical support is offered by the campus health and wellness. Disability support is offered by our disability rights unit. We have a separate uh, gender equity office. Um, information and awareness is offered by pretty much everybody, including faculty. So implementing this model means really getting people from across the university who are housed in structures across the university to work together in a very collaborative way. So one of the important things we've had to do then is to figure out how do we work together in an institution that has historically had these, these very strong silos. Um, and then there are a couple of things that we had to make sure we had in place to even begin to implement this model. So data, we need data to inform the uh, decisions that we're making to inform us about what kind of support is needed and how well it's working. And so it was important to put in place a data analytics, ethics and governance guidelines and Kevin will speak to that a little bit later. And then another important uh, thing that we needed was obviously information, being able to get information to students and from students. And for that, we need a communication strategy. Um, and I have to say that it's really helped since we went into the pandemic that um, we had to put all of our courses onto our learning management system. So I don't know about you guys, but pre-COVID, not every course had a site, an active site on our learning management system. But um, since the pandemic began, since um, April 2020 in our case, uh, every single course has had to have an active site on our learning management system. And in addition, we've been able to create a whole lot of support sites on our learning management system. Um, for example, every single faculty has a student support site uh, on the LMS uh, that, that specifically targets that faculty's um, students. And so actually that's made communication a whole lot easier than previously. So now, although we haven't actually changed any structures, we, we still have the same reporting lines. What we've done is we've created this networked way of working. So we have people and units who are nodes in this network, and we've tremendously strengthened our communication with one another. So, so we do this in a few ways. One is we've created some formal committees and I'm gonna talk about one of the big ones just now. Um, we also now regularly create working groups and task teams to handle particular needs when they arise. Um, and we pull people from across the various structures and units trying to be as inclusive as possible uh, to, to form little, yeah, so working groups, task teams, think tanks to address particular issues. And then once, once that task team or working group has, has finished its task, then we are able to put in place a process or in some cases, a policy. So this has proved to be a really nice way of working. And again, just to say during COVID, it's been fantastic because um, we, we can, well, for one thing, we know each other. Uh, and I think that's been one of the greatest things about this networked way of working is that we actually know who else is doing what on campus, which we really didn't before. Um, and, and then, yeah, we're constantly working together and, and working towards a common goal, because I think that there's tremendous commitment now across the institution to student success. Um, and there's also this, this nice sense of Sorry, I'm getting a bit um, enthusiastic here, but there's this really nice sense of community and camaraderie that comes from people working together, pulling together towards this common goal. And it it's really helps overcome, um, you know, what otherwise can be a, a strong sense of, of isolation and loneliness and, and despair. So, we still have our islands of support in the sense that they are offered by different units in different places. However, 
we have tried to consolidate them. So we don't have so many islands. And then we've created these bridges so that there's a pathway for students to get from one, um, one place that's offering support to another. Uh, and also for the people in the network who are responsible for offering the support, as I said, to be communicating with each other. So we're getting a whole lot better. We, uh, we're not there yet, but we're getting a whole lot better in, in terms of being more holistic and being more communicative and being more student-centered. Uh, I should just mention that I know some institutions rather try to centralize uh, all of their supports. So they'll have like a one-stop shop for students. And, and obviously there are strengths to doing that, but it just wouldn't work at <laughs> this. We, we just couldn't centralize it. The institutional culture just would not allow it. And so this networked way of working is, is much more appropriate given our institutional culture. Okay, so in terms of how student success is governed in the institution, so if we look at the who, the what, and the how, we have a student success committee, and I'm going to elaborate on a, in a moment about that committee and who's on it. We now have this framework, which we've developed. So I showed you the, the heart of it, which is the model, but it's part of a larger document that's, that gives a little bit of an introduction of why do we need a framework and some of the research behind um, student success, uh, particularly Vincent Tinto and George Ku's work, which I guess a lot of you would be familiar with. Um, and then some of the components of the framework and of being able to actually implement the framework. Um, and then the, we, as I mentioned, we have a data governance framework, which Kevin is going to speak to just now. So, so I want to say something about the Student Success Committee because this is very, very important. And, and maybe let me just stand back a minute and talk about the importance of getting institutional structures right. So this is a, an institution that likes having committees a lot. <laughs> In fact, before I came to WITS, I'd never seen a university that had so many committees. <laughs> but um, the advantage to it though, is that you get lots of people being able to have a say. And that's really important. So that, that helps get buy-in and it helps kind of counteract the possibility of, of being too authoritarian or too hierarchical in the way that discussions and decisions take place. So again, thinking about capitalizing on institutional culture, uh, one of the ways we did that in the framework was to then say we needed to establish a high level student success committee, which we did at the beginning of 2020. So the framework that I was referring to earlier was approved by council and Senate at the end of 2019, which was really good timing because then we could draw on it when we uh, uh, went under lockdown during the pandemic. And we established this committee in 2020. So we had had a student success committee before because it was a requirement as uh, one of the Sia Pumalela grant holders, but it was a much lower level committee in terms of the, the standing of the members. And it was largely used as a place for reporting. So now this committee is strengthened and expanded. And, and one of the things we did is um, I, I really, don't like free floating committees. Um, I'm a physicist. I like structure and organization. And I think it's very important that committees fit somewhere and that there are clear reporting lines. So one of the things we did early on with this committee um, was we made it formally a subcommittee of Senate teaching and learning. And it is chaired by the DVC academic, who's also our senior DVC. Um, so that it, it has weight. Um, and then in terms of, I'll come back to the, what it does in terms of the composition. Uh, so we have, um, I'm, obviously I'm on it. Uh, the Dean of Student Affairs is on it. We have the assistant deans from each of the five faculties. 
Kevin is there as the head of business intelligence services. Uh, we have someone from institutional research. We have someone from ICT. Now, this is interesting because before COVID, our ICT unit was pretty technical. Our ICT um, yeah, division was pretty technical, mostly. Um, although we did have some involvement, they did have some involvement in the LMS, but as I said, the LMS was not widely used. But what happened during COVID is when, when we suddenly had to have everybody on the LMS, the, the senior manager in ICT, who among her other responsibilities was also responsible for the LMS, um, got drawn in more and more to the teaching and learning and student success work. And now she is absolutely integral in teaching and learning and student success work. And that's been fantastic. Uh, facilities as well. We have someone from facilities there because obviously the learning and teaching spaces um, and the other spaces uh, that affect um, students have a profound effect on their success. We have someone from finance. Um, we have someone from student, the head, in fact, of student academic development, the head of our learning and teaching center. And then we have both an undergraduate and a postgraduate student leader. Um, so the idea with this committee is that this represents the broad stakeholders across the institution who have a role to play in promoting student success. And we've said very clearly that if you are a member of this committee, you are officially representing your constituency. And so we need you to be champions for student success within your constituency. And we also need you to be bringing information and issues from your constituency to this committee so that as this um, multi-stakeholder committee, we are able to look holistically at what is impacting student success and, and what we need to do better or differently. In terms of the charter, uh, so every committee at BITS has to have a charter. Uh, so what we've said in the charter is that this committee promotes a scholarly evidence-based approach to student success across the university. It's a high level multi-stakeholder committee that identifies and monitors strategic and cross-cutting issues and areas of activity that affect student success at BITS. So you can see it's, it, it's high level, not in terms of its composition only, but also in terms of its brief. So Kevin is going to uh, speak about the details, but I'm wondering, Rabbi, whether this might be a moment to, to actually stop and just ask if there are any questions or comments about the, you know, the kind of broad student success framework that I've, I've been discussing. What do you think? Let's do that, Diane. Okay. We'll allocate a few minutes for any uh, questions, clarification, um, further elaboration. Okay. What uh, Diane has already presented. Colleagues, I invite you to pose your questions or comments. So if there are no burning issues, we can continue and take them up. We do have Ahmed Prof. Go ahead, Ahmed. Um, what I'd like to know is how do you identify those students who are actually not interested in learning uh, or who are enjoying university life to the extent that the academic suffers. Do you identify those? So I, I would not claim to know who is not interested in learning, um, but I would say that we, we do have mechanisms for identifying students who are academically at risk. Um, and I think Kevin will probably speak about that. And uh, those students who are identified, we, we have a process for doing that. Uh, those names are sent to the faculty student advisors. So every faculty has at least two student advisors, some have more, um, and they receive lists from business intelligence services and they also have a dashboard 
where they're able to monitor students who are academically at risk and call them in proactively. So I guess that in that process, maybe they would identify students who may not be that interested, but certainly they will identify students who are not um, meeting the required criteria for academic performance. Thank you. Just another quick question. What about faculty not being interested? Uh, a <laughs> lot of faculty like the old way and, and uh, simply don't attend uh, learning sessions. So um, what do you do about that? So uh, I'm not sure what you mean by learning sessions. Do you mean like webinars and workshops? Is that what you mean? Sorry, can you clarify? Um, Diane? I yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, say you want uh, everybody to understand uh, where the university is going. For example, when we talked about blended learning, uh, I, I think over three quarters of the faculty knew about it or, or did nothing about learning about it. Now, how does one ensure that they get to know something that they're supposed to know? So, so that's, sorry, do you want me to answer or not, Rabbi? No, no, I, I, I will engage with uh, Amit. One on one okay. On one to okay. Problems. So, okay. Are any further comments, questions, or can we hand back to Diane? Back to you, Diane. Thank you. Okay. Then I'm going to mute and hand over to Kevin. Thanks. Thanks, Diane. And I just want to say uh, what a pleasure it is uh, working with Diane on this project. Um, as you can tell, she's positive, open minded, clear thinking, creative. And it really is a joy to work with her. Um, in the earlier slide that you saw around the student success framework at the top, you saw the data governance, the importance of data governance. And just one aspect of it here, where uh, the, the framework uh, outlines the clear roles and responsibilities and cross-cutting partnerships that have to operate. So it's quite an interesting slide. It's done in terms of uh, four personas. We've got the leadership persona, the business persona, the operational persona, and the, what I'd like to call the inside, uh, inside persona at the bottom. The leadership persona, as Diane's discussed, is the student success committee. The business persona includes uh, the data science and artificial intelligence team. The operational persona um, is the data engineering team. And it includes other partnerships such as the Academic Information Systems Unit and ICT. The Academic Information Systems Unit represents the registrar and is responsible for uh, data quality, for maintaining the system, um, and so on. And so they're the data experts around student data. And similarly, we have groups that do that for finance and HR as well. The critical axis that you see there has got to do with question uh, formulation of questions, and the horizontal axis is about uh, providing answers. So, for example, the Student Success Committee is interested in whether this uh, student uh, success program is improving student success, which means we have to have a way of managing that and measuring it. So, the, uh, the, the um, insight a persona at the bottom, comprising the Director of Academic Affairs, the Dean of Students, and the, the Head of BIS, um, will then have to formulate, for example, leading and lagging indicators that are going to talk to the question that's been raised by the Student Success Committee. Then to answer those questions, the business persona in terms of the uh, data science people will then look in the enterprise data warehouse to see whether the data uh, currently exists to answer which whatever question has been raised. If the data is there, then they can go ahead and do the analysis and present it to the Student Success Committee and to the Insight uh, persona. Otherwise, they have to go to the operational persona, um, that's the data engineering team, who will engage with various uh, groups such as AISU and ICT, and perhaps external consultants if the if the system um, is looked after externally. 
and they will then identify and bring in the, the, the required data into the enterprise data warehouse so that the question can be answered. Um, can we move on, please, Diane? Absolutely central to the student success work is the predictive analytics that are provided by the uh, central core there that you see the artificial intelligence and data side of things. Um, and the leading and lagging indicators are there to tell us to measure the institutional impact of what we're doing. But that, that it's sort of exciting uh, for our, our work of using artificial intelligence is limited if you don't have the various building blocks, such as the enterprise platform, which is the enterprise data warehouse, which provides the quality assured data for driving the AI models. Um, you also need the processes that ensure that the data, for example, the, the updated marks in place in time. We've spoken a little bit about the partnerships in the data governance framework and the governance side of things provided by the Student Success Committee, which direct the use cases for the AI models. Diane, we can move on, please. So I'm going to talk a little bit about why business intelligence services is important uh, to student success. It's because BIS is able to acquire the various diverse data sets that inform student success. We're able to integrate this data, such as providing staff-student ratios, the financial situation, accommodation, biographical context, quintiles, et cetera, um, bring that into the picture. We're able to structure the information in a multi-dimensional way that's easy for, easy for non-technical audiences to access and to filter, slice, dice, and drill to support various types of analytics. Facilitate interpretation through data visualization, infographics, and reporting. And we've got models to predict student success using machine learning to enable uh, us to focus on proactive interventions. The team uh, comprises five different areas. Uh, it's data engineering, and they absolutely core about 70% of the work that's done is done in data engineering. And they kind of not seen because their work ultimately only uh, provides value to the institution through the other teams. But if they weren't there, the other teams couldn't do their work. So they provide the enterprise data warehouse plat platform to support reporting and analysis. The data science team, uh, their role is to provide the various types of analytics, descriptive, looking sort of at what's happened, diagnostic, looking at why it's happened, and predictive analytics, such as is a student likely to succeed or not, and also to provide the visualizations and support the institution, institutional planning, monitoring, and student success. So, for example, all of the enrollment planning for DHET, internal enrollment planning, uh, real-time analytics for enrollments, they're all done by the data science team. The institutional research group uh, serves to enrich the data available um, and complement the quantitative analytics with qualitative analytics. And we use their data to make predictions on student success using the data that they collect in the biographical questionnaire. CRM uh, might seem peculiar why it sits in the team, um, but they are aiming to provide a 360 degree view of student engagement um, and support for student success through something called the advisor link platform in Salesforce that was developed with the help of Arizona State University. So they will also provide an integral role uh, to student success and it kind of talks to the communication aspect in the student success framework. And then finally, and very importantly, is the HEMIS team that are responsible for the audited statutory reporting uh, that underpins our subsidy. Thank you, Diane. So the reporting line uh, might be of interest. Um, we've got the ICT area that, that uh, Diane was speaking about and business intelligence services. We have a very close relationship because we can't do our work without the underlying uh, information platforms and networks and so on but we report to different DVCs. So ICT reports to the DVC systems and operations, Professor Jandrell. 
and we report to the uh, senior DVC academic, Professor Osman. The benefits of this uh, approach is that we can focus our, our um, all of our thinking and activity on the analytics perspective, on the business needs and on the academic project, not technology. Technolo we're very good at technology and it's absolutely fundamental to what we do, but that is not our primary focus. Also, this division creates a ring-fenced resources in terms of people, skills, and money, and so on. And it's allowed us to develop specialized skills in the fields of data engineering, data science, artificial intelligence, institutional research as well. Also, special, specialized uh, tools for integration, for reporting, etc. Specialized processes, it's no good, for example, in the ICT area, um, you, you have to have very strict discipline in terms of moving stuff into production. In our area, um, the importance is being able to answer questions on the fly very quickly. And so we need to have different types of more agile processes to make that happen. The ICT side will focus on something called entity relational design for the operational systems. I'm not going to go into that. The difference with us is we focus on dimensional design that I'm going to talk a little bit about. And this enables us to be agile and responsive. Thank you, Diane. So the academic affairs portfolio is very important in all the student success work. We've got, uh, as, as you've seen, uh, Diane, who's the director of academic affairs, Dr. Wissing, who's the director of the Center for Teaching, Learning, and uh, Learning, Teaching, and Development. We've got Professor Beatrice Lacay, the acting director for part-time studies. Myself, heading up business intelligence services, and the senior DVC for the ap academic portfolio that brings together all of these senior senior managers who work closely to support student success. So this is a rather complicated slide. Um, over the years, we've been going for a number of years. These are the 50 plus uh, data marts that have been de developed for the in, in, in the enterprise data warehouse. Um, they're known as dimensional data marts and you'll, you'll see just now why we, why we call it that. And they're designed to answer what's called known questions because we will get requirements before building a data mart and there will be certain questions that need to be answered by the data mart. There's another layer, a deeper layer of the data warehouse that uh, is much more detailed and integrated. And that layer is there to answer un unknown questions that are posed on the fly, but that requires technical people to, to answer them. So you can see here uh, marked in red are some of the data marts associated with student success, things like admissions, residence, financial aid, prizes and awards, the student information system, recons, et cetera, et cetera. And those are all used in students in the AI modeling for student success. There we go. So this is just a sort of very high level, uh, easy, interpret, easy to interpret slide that shows what dimensional design is all about. In the center, you have something called uh, additive facts, such as the number of enrollments, the number of dropouts, number of people who've passed and the number of people who've failed. And on the outside is the dimensions, which are the means by which the facts are accessed. So you've got the period like year, you've got the organizational area like faculty, you've got the degree and qualification, you've got the program, you've got the plan and you've got the courses. And non-technical users can, can access these the, the facts via the various uh, dimensions. So for example, at the highest level, uh, you might for the whole university, just look at 2022, what are the total number of enrollments? Uh, that doesn't require any drill down and it's very easy to access. On the other hand, you might want to know the number of dropouts in the faculty, faculty of engineering. You would go to the dimension faculty, you'd select engineering, and then you'd get uh, the, the answer that you're looking for. And you can drill down further and further into the detail to do what's called diagnostic analysis. Thank you. Thank you, Diane. 
So we've got various uh, processes from the, the building blocks that you saw earlier that have to be in place. So we've got to have course and lecture data available in the student information management system. We've got to have the assessment structures and marks uploaded into that system. We've got to have the data um, relating to first years collected during orientation and registration, uh, and including the biographical questionnaire. We need the student advisors very importantly, very importantly to upload the, the interventions into the intervention site. We've got to do training of the predictive models based on this data, and we've got to uh, create dashboards. So just talking a little bit about the leading and lagging indicators, the way we manage student success. The lagging indicators are what uh, people most commonly use, that's to analyze past performance. So for example, what has been our throughput rate uh, over X number of years. Leading indicators are more important uh, to develop. Uh, they're there to kind of influence future performance before it happens. And we'll talk a little bit about that just now, if we can move on, please. So the lagging indicators you'd be very familiar with. So it's things like increased completion rate, uh, the, talking to the number and percentage of students from each cohort that complete in minimum time, or minimum plus one, minimum plus two, et cetera. Indicator two is decreased time to completion. So that's the comparative number and percentage of students from each cohort who complete in minimum time. Indicator three is the decreased disparities in completion rates by race and gender. Um, and that's percentage completion rates per cohort by race and gender. So the more important leading indicators are the predictive measures that anticipate the output measures. And just remember that all of these indicators were designed by the um, insight uh, um, uh, persona to meet the needs of the Student Success Committee that I spoke about earlier. So indicator four uh, is increased retention, the number and percentage of students by cohort who remain registered from semester to semester or year to year. Increased progression, the number and percentage of students by cohort who progress from one year of study to the next. Sufficient credit points because the load that a student is taking is very important. It's the number and percentage of students by cohort who've achieved the required number of credits per year of study. Uh, they, students uh, who are do, doing a lower number of credits might look like they're succeeding, but they won't pass in minimum time, which is why that's so important. Then it's decre decreasing the bottlenecks, the number of courses with high number uh, of students or the percentage of students who fail. That's important too, because it's not only the courses with high failure rates, it's also big courses that might have low failure rates, but the numbers of students uh, concerned is high. And then the uptake of advising, the number of students identified to be at risk by the uh, AI models um, who actually report and consult with an advisor. Developed uh, with the help of ICT, uh, we've developed a, what's called a quick capture intervention site. The idea was that um, the advisors are much more focused on actually engaging with students rather than capturing data, and that's their purpose. So we wanted them to be able to capture an intervention within 30 seconds, and we've, we've actually achieved that. Um, and it's linked to SIMS to enable student advisors to link the student numbers and access the data if needed to record the interventions with students. Um, and it followed discussions with the advisors, BIS, ICT, Academic Affairs, Student Affairs, and we identified 10 categories of issues uh, that, that could be used instead of requiring uh, advisors to, to manually capture each uh, intervention separately. So that's got to do with life skills, career and curriculum, academic content, et cetera, et cetera. That, that relates to the supports uh, that we spoke about earlier in the student success framework. So this is just one of the dashboards uh, that are available. This gives the intervention data summary, um, and you can see the, the number of interventions by faculty. You can see the number of interventions by issue type, 
uh, etc. This is useful for the Student Success Committee to make sure that the interventions are being captured. And the problem is if the interventions are not being captured, the uh, predictions of the AI models become uh, unstable. Diane. So now we're just going to talk right at the core, the, the artificial intelligence, machine learning models, etc. We're going to talk a little bit about that. We can go to the next slide. So we've got three key uh, AI uh, models that have um, are in production. The first predicts the likelihood of the first year, first time entering student passing the year. And if the if it predicts that the student is not going to pass the year, then that information is made available to the advisors to contact the student and arrange appropriate interventions. There's a second one that predicts the likelihood of a student returning, persisting into the following semester or the following year. Again, if, if that uh, doesn't look like it's going to happen, we give the advisors uh, a heads up so that they can contact the student. And then we also predict the likelihood of a student completing in minimum time, again, to try to address the course load issues, et cetera, et cetera. So this is a, an example of one of the dashboards that's available to the advisors. And you can see on the left-hand side, faculty, student number, snapshot of months, system name. So that relates to the dimensions that I was talking about earlier. The, the advisor can select the faculty, they can go, drill down to individual students, et cetera. And you can see it shows the student's probability of persistence. With those that are very high, you might want to congratulate them to, to, to encourage them. Uh, for those that are low, very low, those are the, the students at risk that uh, the advisors are interested in. And also the people with moderate chance of persisting, those are the ones you might want to encourage to get over the hump because they would probably be the easiest to, uh, types of interventions. And you can see the probab probability of persistence um, and the numbers of students there, and those can be clicked on also to, to drill down to the actual number of students. You also have inf information on the LMS session engagement at the bottom, and so on. Thank you, Diane. Here's where you can, the advisors can drill down to the individual students. Uh, it's blocked out just for the poppy uh, compliance side of things but that's by student number and student name, et cetera, and the contact details. This is how the advisors can arrange interventions with uh, individual students or with groups of students. Thank you, Diane. So one of the big problems that we, we've experienced over the years, the skills to do what we do are specialized and they're in high demand. There's a global shortage of uh, data science skills, data engineering skills, et cetera. And we have, we, our feeling is that we have the best minds on campus and we should be, should be using that. So we have, we've developed a, a vacation works a program. And that program is intended to bring students in twice in a single year for two weeks uh, in June and two weeks in November, December. We train them on data engineering, uh, skills and data science skills. We then pick out the, the, the people who are um, show, the, show the best potential and we encourage them to do their postgraduate studies. And when they do their postgraduate studies, we uh, get them to come and work for us um, at the same time. So for, for example, if they're doing a um, two-year master's in engineering, we'll get them to work for, work for us. So this uh, creates a, a wonderful pipeline of talent uh, for BIS, and it's part of what the university is here to do. And many of the people who've gone through this process have got fantastic, uh, fantastic jobs and uh, have said that the, the training they've received uh, was, you know, contributed to them getting those jobs. So who is it? Um, it's the students from maths and stats, computer science, information systems, and engineering and physics uh, who we get to work in mixed teams. And our biggest challenge is we had 110 applications for 15 places. We need to find ways of funding and scaling up this popular and su successful program. 
I think that's probably the end. Okay. So going forward, um, we are aiming to promote greater use of the BI dashboards uh, to help identify where we're not making good progress. Um, people don't like to log into systems, well, certain, certain types of people and for good reason. And so we, help, we assist them by sending them reports at regular intervals and so on. But we would like to encourage people to be able to go into the system at any time and get the updated information. We're also continuing to develop uh, AI models and use them proactively to reach out to students who might be academically at risk of not succeeding. I think that's the, the last slide. Yeah, so um, any, are there any questions around uh, the data and data governance side of things? I have to say it blows me away. I think it's just absolutely amazing what PIS does. <laughs> Ravi, are you going to moderate this? Yeah, sure. Tim, please go ahead. Thanks. <clears throat> thank you, Ravi. Uh, th thank you uh, the pre to the presenters for, for such a lovely uh, presentation. Um, I, I'm, I, I'm, I'm from, uh, Trevor Maestri from ICS. And I'm more interested in the types of systems and the AI integrations that you are doing, um, data modeling and data, data, data analysis, um, to get to, to actually bring out this information um, that will help us to predict the future of the students and where they're at risk. Um, so if, if, if Ravi, uh, through you, um, I'd like to engage you more um, both our presenters to, to learn more about their systems and how they are using them. Thanks, Ravi. Uh, thanks, Trevor. Uh, Rushil, is that, do you have a similar question uh, related? Um, no, I was just asking, I just wanted to know about, um, I saw in the screenshot there were 5,000 students. So I was just wondering, um, well, was that accumulated from a data source? Or I think you did mention it people are logging in, uh, are they logging in these students? And um, I also just wanted to know about uh, which predictive models did you use? Um, and, you know, aspects about, you know, if you could just fill us in with aspects about training your predictive models, um, uh, testing them, um, you know, some of the, the learning analytics details that, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't mind, I mean, if, if you could, just point us to to some, uh, you know, some of your work in terms of you know how looking at that process because uh, currently that's part of my research. Okay, um, thanks, Kevin. You can choose to answer any, all, or none of those questions. <laughs> so we very we engage we engage quite quite a lot with uh, other institutions. So we're very happy to to perhaps have a more in-depth uh, meeting around uh, what is being done in uh, the artificial intelligence side. The person who heads up that area is very enthusiastic and uh, loves uh, passing on that knowledge. So we would very much welcome an engagement there. The um, focus around training models um, is a whole area or discipline called machine learning operations. Uh, we use specialized tools such as NIAM to do the integration. Um, and then we use Python and R, et cetera, to do predictions and so on. So again, um, I'm not going to, I don't use that hands-on. So I would rather that uh, the person who's responsible for that talks to that side of things. But we do need to justify the predictions we make. And that's done on a snapshot at a point in time. So all of those snapshots need to be uh, stored, maintained, versioned, so that if there is a question of where did this particular prediction come from, that we can go back and, uh, and um, uh, justify it, et cetera, or make a correction if something's gone wrong. I saw a question there about where do we get our funding from? So the funding from the, for the student work experience is, 
is in our uh, salary budget. We, we budget for that on an ongoing basis because it's become part and parcel of what we do. And in the long term, it actually saves us money because to hire trained, fully trained professionals um, is a lot more expensive, number one. And secondly, they don't understand the university business. So it makes much better sense to us to bring in students, train them, um, and they're part of the university and it, and it assists them in future, future employability. Thank you for that, Kevin. Um, Manoj, has your question about AI been answered? All right, we'll, we'll come back to Manoj. Anna, please no, go ahead. No, uh, sorry, sorry. Uh, 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 it, it hasn't really been answered. I just want to know, you know, we, we use the term AI quite freely, and I'm wondering whether we talk about an expert system. Can you please get a little closer to the bike, Manoj? Here we go. Oh, it's better. There you go. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. I, I'm saying we use the term AI quite freely uh, often in, in, uh, in many contexts, uh, not necessarily here, but, you know, I, I so no, no, are, we, are we really talking about an expert system or a true AI in terms of its learning capabilities? So we're talking about the machine learning algorithms in the Azure platform uh, on the Microsoft uh, Azure side of things. So it's, it's mach the machine learning aspect of AI. Okay, thanks. And I've got another question there, Ravi, if I can just go ahead. Uh, yes, please. Uh, you know, I posted the question, what level of executive support is required for this to be successful. I mean, there are many initiatives, and you know, but without uh, support, often fail. And 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 in in and if, you know, in addition to that, what kind, you you spoke of the student skills uh, that that you bring on board and train, but I assume that's a, that's an ongoing process because students come and go. Uh, how how do you embed this kind of learning? in the system so, so you have some kind of continuity. So there must be staff that are there more or less permanently uh, to keep this going. And how many do you need? And you know, what's the cost of this kind of intervention totally? So it is an expensive unit to run. And we fortunately have key staff who, who kind of the pillars of, of, of the unit in each of those five areas who've been here for a long time. And they are also fully invested in training, uh, training up new students. So it's absolutely, as you say, correct that we need um, that those long-term uh, deep skills to pass that on. And the students that we have, we have about five students working for us at any one time as interns. And those usually work for us for a two-year period, some of them a lot longer. And some where we have, uh, you know, um, so staff who've left the university, we would then first consider the students we've trained to, to fill those vacancies. So a number of our permanent staff actually come from the students that we've trained as well. Kevin, how many permanent staff do you have? It's about a dozen or so, am I right? Uh, it's about 15, I think. 15 permanent staff, so it's a big yeah. unit. Yeah, and about five interns. Thank and then you. the issue about top level support, I think it's absolutely critical. I mean, we're very lucky in that uh, student success is the sweet spot for, for what we do. And uh, the machine learning side of things uh, really hits the, that nail on the head with uh, making more accurate predictions around whether students are likely to, to succeed or not. So we're really lucky in having a use case that is of fundamental importance to the university and also having, as, as Diane has pointed out, we've got the senior DVC academic, uh, the, the, the senior director of academic affairs involved. So without, without that help and without all of the surrounding work that's been done, those building blocks that we've talked about today, uh, the AI models on their own would be of very little use. Mm. But sorry, I just want to clarify one thing. Um, so although Kevin's unit is doing this fabulous work in the area of student success, we, I don't want to create the impression that this is all they do. <laughs> so, I mean, part of why I think the university is willing to support them is because, you know, they, they do, as Kevin indicated earlier, um, all of the, they provide all of the data and the analytics for uh, all of the functions of the university. 
So I think that's absolutely key. So all of the sort of planning functions, HR, finance, students, et cetera, is done using the information in the warehouse. We took a decision long ago to make sure that the operational reporting for finance, students, staff, all come from the warehouse. The, the thinking being is that the high level planning information, if that's based on uh, all of the operational eyes being on the data and making sure that it's correct, then our planning will be much better. And we have very few complaints around the, um, the quality of the information in the, in the warehouse. We, we have 30 audits that run every night to make sure that's what, what's in the, the warehouse ties up with what's in the underlying operational systems. And we also, that, that process serves to clean the data in the, in, in the underlying systems as well. So um, as Diane said, it's used for all of our um, executive management reporting, mid-level management and operational reporting. And, and the other thing, um, as, as Kevin's just said, you know, having these audit reports that run daily, um, what it does is it makes sure that we have a single, correct, dependable source of information um, because it's very risky for an institution if you have data scattered all over the place um, and, and that it can potentially conflict. And also just a very important aspect that I didn't talk too much about is we have partnerships with other units such as the Academic Information Systems Unit for Student Data, the HR Information Systems Unit for HR Data, and the Financial Information Management Systems for their financial data. And we don't do the operational reporting. We, we don't have sufficient capacity for that. But what those units do is they take the tools that we provide, the training we provide, they develop and quality assure reports that then get, get scheduled and made available to, throughout the university. So those units are specifically focused on their individual disciplines uh, using the data in the Enterprise Data Warehouse. And we engage with them very closely. For example, as I spoke about bringing new data into the warehouse, they're the data experts in their systems. We would engage closely with them to find where the data is and to extract it and bring it in. Sometimes it's a frustration. So for example, um, Diane will ask the question, did the data um, gateway to student success orientation program, has the student engagement um, with the LMS during that orientation program, is it predictive of how a student is gonna perform or not? And to get that data into the warehouse is, is proving difficult because the instructor who provides our LMS system uh, is, 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 is um, not providing that data as readily as we would like. Okay. Um, Anna, if your question is still relevant, please go ahead. Uh, thanks, Rob. I think a lot of what I wanted to say has somehow been been answered in the discussion that just um, transpired. I just wanted to say this is um, actually a quite an interesting, you know, uh, presentation. I'm quite intrigued um, as someone who also does research on on student success, and I do believe maybe Rabbi, this is more for you. I do believe that you know it's quite possible for UKZN to come up with something like this, because I've come across you know uh, an, a lot of maybe not a lot but a few studies you know that sort of like uses a lot of like the you know machine learning um, you know AI in student success from UKZN staff, and I think you know if that all that you know. Um, I would say could be harnessed into like a team because it's happening, but in silos. So it won't be as effective, you know, and as intriguing as what FITS has in place. But I do believe there are quite a, a few people within UKZN who have, you know, the capacity, you know, to, to do something like this, but they've been doing, you know, a little bit of this in their little silos. Now, if all of that is put together, you know, I'm pretty sure that we, we could have something, maybe not exactly as what FITS has, but I'm pretty sure we could have something that actually works for UKZN. Thank you for that, uh, Anna. Um, Shelley, you have a comment? Uh, yes, 
Thank you so much, um, uh, Rabbi. And very, very nice to see you, Diane. We go way back, um, way, way back. And uh, you're still as inspirational as ever. Um, and that is just great. So thank you so much to both of you. I could kick myself, actually, because I've just had an opportunity to employ two interns. And I would have actually, I should have changed the criteria to do more a data science person than a psychology person. And um, I, I, I'm quite irritated with myself. So I'll have to like um, think about how to do this going forward. But just to say to you that we as student counseling are sitting on enormous amounts of excellent data. Um, and our, we have a number of challenges. The one is that we, the confidentiality, um, the sensitivity of the data that we that we are sitting on. Um, any ideas on how your student counseling manages uh, the sensitive issues? Because I think that if we could use some of the data that we are able to get uh, from our consultations with our students, that would be very helpful as a predictive um, mechanism and also for us to be able to assess impact. So I don't know if you've got any thoughts on that. Thank you so much. So, so maybe I can have a first go at that. And yeah, very nice to see you as well, Shelley. Um, so I know that our student counseling unit also is very concerned about, about confidentiality and the sensitivity. So I, you know, I think, and, and I don't think we've cracked that nut yet. Um, so with the intervention side that Kevin was referring to earlier, uh, it, it's a partial solution. Um, so what, what we had done is we'd actually sat down uh, with a range of student advisors. And I think we also had some people from counseling unit there to say, okay, what are the broad categories of things that students are coming from, coming for? And, and can we agree that these are, you know, there'll be others, but these are the main things. Um, so that's, that's one thing to do is to say, okay, let's not, we don't have to look at the details of um, what this particular student's challenges are, but we can say it is in the area of food security. It is in the area of mental health or whatever. That's, that's a very kind of rough way to do it. There are more sophisticated ways to do it where you, you know, you, you put up all kinds of, um, password protection at various levels so that you de-link the student's identity. Um, Kevin, maybe you want to say more about that? So we did meet with the, the head of the area counseling, counseling and careers. And the problem is that certain students, especially where there are, for example, psychological issues, et cetera, um, if they, they don't want other students or anyone to know that they've been for assistance and so on. And, if they get the idea that they have to, for example, record that they've gone to careers and counseling unit, even if we don't know what it's for, um, then it might push them away. And that is the focus, and it's a very important focus for that area. So we didn't uh, we didn't really push it or pursue it any further for those reasons. Mm. But but I do think it's possible. I think that with the with the right use of um, passwords and permissions. You you could do it. You uh, you know you could collect the data and anonymize it, um, in a way that does protect the student's identity. Thank you so much. Back to you, Anna. Yeah, Shelley. You know, I I, I was at um at another. I think it was a workshop where a similar a similar issue was raised. And I remember one, uh, I think from one other university, I can't remember which one, they did mention that they do have, uh, when students come for consultation, rather than using the student number, they also use um, you know, another code for the student. So if you're going to give the data to someone else to analyze, you know, it doesn't have student numbers, but at least it has certain codes that the person can use to, ana to analyze. So it's a way of anonymizing the data and no one will know which student actually, you know, Say this kind of kind of information. So I know it might be a lot of work uh, on the psychologist to have to do that. You know, you know, sort of like how you capture your data. But that's what some are actually doing. So the data can go out without uh, to whoever is going to do the analysis for you if it's not within your unit. But it will not have like any information that can identify specific students. Thanks, Anna. Let's talk. Um, further. I'm, I'm very interested. Thank you. 
thank you, colleagues. Um, why don't you add your hand up and then you can lower it. Yes, Ravi, uh, I posted some questions, but I think it's being missed. Uh, the, you know, I asked about executive support earlier. Just to follow up to that, uh, to, to what, uh, which, where does this unit report? I think reporting structures are very important to understand you know, the functioning of uh, uh, any, anything within a university. And, and, and then also, uh, uh, I, I think, Kevin, you mentioned about, uh, about the, you know, the running 30 audits a day and the information being, uh, but how, how accessible is this information to staff? Is it through a form field that just you log in and get information or is it a process? Um, you know, information is valuable if it's accessible, I think. And uh, as a staff member at a university, if I wanted to see something about my students or trends or whatever the case may be, would I just be able to log in and get it? Thank you. So um, as I said earlier, showed on one of the slides that we report to the DVC, uh, the senior DVC academic. It's, and, and she strongly supports uh, both our general information uh, capability as well as the student success side of things. Um, sorry, your second question there? Was about who gets to access the data and what data yeah. and how. So we have a system whereby people can request access. Uh, their line managers got to approve it. It can be audited. We train them and then they can gain access to the system. And there are various levels of access. There are people who can just request reports to run that have been pre-built. There are other ones, uh, depending on their role, who can build reports. There's a process whereby reports that have been built by individuals can get quality assured and then published to a wider audience. So there's a very variable way of doing things. We also uh, the data science people are sometimes the biggest users of the, the warehouse because a lot of people like to ask the question rather than going into the data themselves. And we will pull, the, pull together the information and present it. We have something, for example, called a quinquennial review. Um, that, uh, and that we will pull and send that data uh, to he who, whichever head of school is being reviewed. And then they can ask for additional summaries um, and nuances to the data, et cetera. We also send out things like executive summaries to the senior executive team when they're going on a retreat. We send out faculty executive summaries to the deans. We send out heads of schools ex executive summaries. We've engaged with all of these different groups to identify what needs to go into that, those summaries. And so it's very, there's a very varied way of accessing the data and it, it all depends on people's roles and preferences. So and if I can just add, um, quite a lot of the data is in the format of a dashboard. Um, so you get, if you've been given permission, you can then access one or more of the dashboards and then you can, you can see the data and you can apply the filters that are of interest to you um, and, and yeah, work with it. So, so like one of the things I was really interested in was the LMS logins um, when we were uh, when we went into lockdown, um, and so BIS built a dashboard for LMS logins, and so I could then just log into the system and I could see what the LMS logins looked like, and then if I wanted to, I could break it down by by faculty, undergraduate, postgraduate, whatever. Thank you, Diane. Um, Trevor, I note your comment about your interest in the data warehouse. And I can tell you that the WITS folks are very generous, very open and happy to share. So, and in fact, we, we did visit just prior to the lockdown and we promised to go back and didn't have the opportunity. So Trevor, if your unit is interested, let's talk and let's talk to Diane and Kevin about spending a day with them. Uh, Ahmed, you have your hand up. Is it a question about right, data? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. The uh, question I wanted to ask is: um, uh, uh, you mentioned about training students, um, uh, you know, uh, 
does that mean that they actually then go on to teach those students who are having difficulties, uh, Kevin? So we, we train them in data engineering and data science. Um, yeah. And they would obviously, if they become interns on a longer term basis. So we have a number of students who come in, they'll do the tra two week training in June, the two week training in November, and we, we won't see them again. But we've got others who then become interns and start working for us. So they will obviously assist the next uh, group of students who comes in, uh, et cetera, in terms of helping to train them. So it's kind of bootstrapping. Okay. Um do you charge extra to those students who get that uh, tuition? We actually pay them. No, I mean the ones that they train. No, so the two, the, we have spoke about the, the work experience, the two weeks in June, two weeks in November. We actually pay those students to come and attend the course. So it's really in their best interest. And it's in our interest because it's, that's why there's so many that come and we can identify the best. Uh, we then bring them in as interns and we pay them uh, during that internship. And obviously when they train additional students, they don't get paid extra, they're part of our unit. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Kevin. Um, we have I... tried through the CETAs to get funding, but it's it hasn't really, it should have uh, paid off for us, but it hasn't so far. Okay, folks, I don't see any further questions in the Q&A or the chat that haven't been responded to yet. Uh, another question from Manoj, do you incorporate research data into your analyses? We, we have uh, various research studies done by the institutional research unit, so the graduate exit, exit survey, first year experience, uh, etc. We collect biographical questionnaire data, which is, uh, you know, around the students, new students' backgrounds. That gets pulled into the warehouse. So, yes, we do use the research, the information collected by the institutional researchers. And they also have their own uh, standalone studies uh, based on the, the qualitative information they collect. And those studies are then prevent, presented to executive management. Thank you, Kevin. Sorry, Ravi. I was just going to follow up. Uh, what I was meaning was, I understand that your unit would do research and incorporate that. I was thinking more along the lines of uh, postgrad students and, and staff research into teaching and learning. And, you know, there might be students doing research on WITS University itself, you know, often like at our university, students often use our students as subjects of their research. Would that kind of data be included? So we do have people who come and request data from us. Uh, they obviously have to get ethical clearance and so on. Um, you know, it's not a great deal of students, but there are a number who, who do come. Um, and uh, I think the student advisors do some research with with their data as well. Diane, perhaps you can comment there. Yeah, so, but I, I'm wondering if Manoj is asking the opposite question of whether the results of research are impacting on on the way we are using and, and analyzing our data. Is, is that your that, question? That, that is my question. Are you using the outcomes yeah. of the research? Yeah. Um, no. I <laughs> think the answer is no. It's <laughs> like no, you said his hand up. Uh, Louis, so is that yes, a Prof. Yes, Prof. Um, there is a question that was asked earlier on. If I may just quickly read it, it reads as follows. An important aspect for student success is involving students in student content creation and being co-creators in curriculum development. How was this addressed? That's the question. Okay. This, this, the theme of this seminar is not curriculum. So I'm not expecting our presenters to be able to answer that directly unless they want to hazard a response. Yeah. So. I'm going to try and share a slide here. Um, I did actually see this question. So 
I mentioned to you that we used systems thinking when we developed the student success framework. And uh, this, is, this is one of the, the tools in students uh, in systems thinking. So it's called the poached egg model, <laughs> um, where you talk about sibling systems. Um, so there's, there's a large containing system. So in our case, that would be the entire university. And then you have um, sibling systems and then you decide what is going to be the focus for um, your particular application of systems thinking. So if you don't select subsystems and you don't delineate a system in focus, then you're not actually doing systems thinking anymore because you're looking at everything. So, so when we did the student success framework, we, we drew a boundary and we said, we are some things we are not going to look at in drawing up this framework. So we're not going to look at the formal academic program um, and nor are we going to look at physical facilities and resources, not because they're not important, but because they need to be dealt with elsewhere um, and not as part of this framework development. So yeah, we're not talking about that here. We do talk about it, however, in other places like the Senate Teaching and Learning Committee, and the faculty teaching and learning committees. Thank you, Diane. Um, it seems like we are nearing the end. I don't see any further comments in the chat, no further hands. Um, would you like the last word, Kevin and Diane? So, um... Kevin, do you want to say something? And then maybe I'll give the last, last word. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, it's it's been an absolute pleasure sharing our experiences. Uh, through the Siya Pumalela area, we found that uh, there's no one right way of doing things. We're sharing what we do, and uh, we like to learn from others as well. So we're very happy to engage with you further, et cetera. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. And and yeah, thank you for this opportunity to, to share what we're doing. As you know, when you have to talk about what you do, it makes you reflect on what you do. <laughs> um, and, and maybe maybe just, uh, you know, we've, we've tried to, to give you some information about our, our structures and so on. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, Peter Drucker's famous, famous statement about um, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Um, so you have to, in the end, decide what will work for your own institutional culture. Thanks. Absolutely. Thank you, Diane. So uh, you've taken us through an epic journey of your structures and your development and your facilities, which, to say the least, are, are very impressive. Um, and I'm making this offer to this team on your behalf to invite them to engage further in selected aspects of your presentation uh, sometimes going forward. So thank you immensely. We are forever grateful, Diane, Kevin. Colleagues, um, thank you for joining us in this session. I hope it's been as rewarding for you as it has been for me. And do join us in further conversations around data and decision making. Do have a pleasant weekend. Thank you all. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.